Okay. Thank you. Thank you all for, for uh, coming, you know, um, and thank UNOPS for um, uh, sustaining this, you know. So uh, I actually, I wrote a book um, uh, back in 2008 uh, about energy and climate. It was called Hot, Flat, and Crowded. And my favorite chapter in the book was, um, uh, if it isn't boring, it isn't green. <laughs> um, if it isn't boring, it isn't green. And uh, the chapter was actually about, um, I said, you know, everyone kind of would like to be Al Gore, and I'd like to be Al Gore and win an Oscar and an Emmy and all these kind of things and a Nobel Prize and, and um, have people stop me on the street. You know. um, but um, I said, you know, one of the great heroes of the green movement at the time was a guy from NRDC who had figured out how to cut in half the energy usage of every Coke machine. Now, when you actually cut in half the energy use of every soda pop dispenser in the world, think of the impact you make on the climate. But to do that, you just need to know two things. The engineering of a soda pop machine and how it interfaces with the infrastructure of a public electricity utility. Now, I'm going to, this is all between us, but there is nothing more boring on God's green earth than the infrastructure of a public electricity utility, okay? <laughs> um, but when you master that, it's just amazing the impact you can have on the world and on the climate. And so that's really gonna be our talk here today, how from the perspective of finance and infrastructure um, uh, and governance, we can actually do something that is incredibly boring, but incredibly <laughs> green. Okay, so we, we, have a, uh, we have a great panel here. Um, uh, I'm just going to move to my left. Um, Akumumi uh, Adesina, the president of the African Development Bank. Akumi, thank you. Um, my old friend Julia Gillard, uh, former prime minister of Australia and now um, chairing the Wellcome Trust uh, in Australia. Um, uh, Greta Fremov, who from UNOPS. Greta, thank you for inspiring all this. Uh, Marielka from the World Bank. Um, thank you, and an, another old friend. And we're waiting also for the First Lady of Costa Rica who will, who will join us um, uh, in a second. So I'm just gonna go around and, and sort of, um, uh, uh, we'll start with a round of questions, maybe do a couple rounds, and then we're gonna open it up to you. We're gonna enlist you in, uh, in, in, in this uh, discussion. Um, I can, let, me, let me start with you. Um, Africa uh, has huge infrastructure challenges, just in general. Um, and then uh, looming ones um, with climate change. Talk about how uh, you think about those challenges, um, uh, where you're making progress, and, and where you're looking for, for help. Well, thanks very much, and you know, thanks for inviting us uh, to this meeting. I actually didn't know this existed, uh, but Tom was telling us that this is the real COP, so it's good to be at the real COP finally. I is thought there I was. COP yeah, oh yeah, was. yeah. Well, you know, the the fact of the matter is that uh, when it comes to to infrastructure in Africa, you have massive infrastructure deficits. The, the continent's infrastructure deficit is anything financing is anything between sixty-eight billion dollars to one hundred eight billion dollars. And that covers energy, that covers transport, it covers uh, digital infrastructure. Of course, now with COVID-19, you know, out on top of that, then you have a lot more in terms of the healthcare, quality healthcare infrastructure that, uh, that you need. Um, as a bank, we've invested $40 billion in, in, in trying to do that. We can talk about that later in the, in the conversation. Thank you. You know, I was thinking, um, preparing for this, Greta, that um, uh, I've been going through a, a transformation in my own thinking, because I, I mean, I come out of the, you know, I'm technically the foreign affairs columnist for the New York Times. And so um, I, I really noticing something just in, as I write about the world that, um, especially when I write about the Middle East, that we're seeing a real bifurcation between what I call resilience leaders and resistance leaders, <laughs> you know. So the old story was leaders who develop their legitimacy by resistance resistance to America, resistance to their neighbor, resistance to another you know, sect or clan or, or whatever. But I think we're starting to see um, a, a shift um, in places like the UAE, even in Saudi Arabia in its own way, of leaders who say, well, my legitimacy now is not going to depend on my resistance. Mm -hmm. The resistance I generate, but the resilience I generate. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I only say that to say that UNOPS you may, we may think it's like, oh, what, now what does that stand for again? <laughs> you know, but I think you're actually at the center of a very interesting shift um, uh, going on right now. And so I'm interested in, in just how you, 
how you look at this infrastructure role, what are people coming to you for, or world leaders, and what are you trying to project out into the world? So to answer your question directly, Tom, yeah. uh, the OPCW, the Organization for the Proliferation of Chemical Weapons, uh -huh. came to UNOPS to destroy the chemical facilities in Syria. Interesting. That's we very took interesting. Well, them out, wow. all of them, That's without any accidents to the people working there, wow. and also not engaging, of course, yeah. in the conflict. Right. Yeah. Mm. Very interesting. But we also know that infrastructure, right. you said it, yeah. is perceived as boring. Yes. <laughs> not by me, and of how course. Could right? that be? I was speaking for them. How, but I mean, how could <laughs> that be when yeah. Jill is saying <laughs> that it's impacting yeah. everything? Yeah. Absolutely. And also, uh, it has to be invested in yeah. the right way. Because yeah. if we do these decisions wrongly up front, right. they will last yes. for decades. Mm, that's right. So they lock us in when we decide. So as we come out of the pandemic, how are you thinking about that then? So how are we thinking about that? Being mandated in infrastructure and procurement and project management by the General Assembly yeah. of the UN, we need to get this right mm. and build back better. Mm. So when we look for the solutions, it's not about yesterday, it's how we can take the right steps forward. And frankly, we as practitioners, we have to work with partners. Here is one very good partner, the World Bank. I mean, we work with governments, we work with NGOs, we work with those who can help us drive innovation, who can help us find the smart solutions, mm -hmm. because it's about schools, it's about health services, so hospitals and medical centers, it's about homes, it's about roads, it's about everything. So we partnered with the University of Oxford, with the UN Environment Programme, and have actually looked into what is the impact of infrastructure. Actually bad infrastructure is causing 79% of the green gas emissions. What would be an example of bad infrastructure? So we invest a lot in brown energy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when we now look for new uh, sources of energy, of course, as UNOPS, we look for how we can apply solar panels, wind, hydro, we look for off-grid solutions because when we look at many of the places where we work, whether it's in the Middle East or maybe it's also uh, uh, Sub-Saharan, we look for off-grid solutions. We have provided electricity to a number of mun municipalities in Sierra Leone who would not have had any opportunity to electricity if it hadn't been off-grid. So actually driving these new ways into the solutions, I think, is core. And when we look at the costs of adaptation, mm -hmm. again, 88% probably of the costs in infrastructure uh, will actually uh, either make or break it. Mm -hmm. So if we do these 88% mm -hmm. of investments wrongly, well, then again, we lock in our ability to come to a net zero uh, uh, society. So we call for a new way of working, doing the integrated planning and do the design right from the start. Of course, also the construction and later maintenance and management of uh, the infrastructure itself. Because we know from our societies we have seen people digging in our roads. So first comes the ones who are looking for the solution for electricity, and the week after came the one for the water, and then telecom the third week, and off they went, and next year they came back because there was something missing in the first place. Interesting. And we need to get it right in the first place. So this is where you know this is. Uh, Very interesting. Um, let me just follow up with a couple of questions, then we're going to open to the floor uh, real, real soon. So please um, sharpen your questions. Um, 
you, there, there's sort of a debate that goes on, maybe more in America than other places, of you know that serious people know we can't mitigate anymore. She's so got to focus on adaptation. I mean, you, you people, you know, you silly people think you, this, the scale of the problem is just too big. I mean, okay, maybe there is climate change, maybe there, but let's focus on adaptation. That debate goes on in a lot of places in America, and and my response to that often is that. Um, uh, actually, you're, to make this bifurcation is really dangerous because the more you mitigate now, the less you're going to have to adapt later. Mm -hmm. But if you sort of give up on mitigation um, uh, and, and then say, well, now, please, you know, you're, you're saying just, just learn to get over it, um, uh, strikes me as a really dangerous argument. And I just want to throw that out there if anyone wants to pick up, pick up. Why, why don't you start, Greg, because you're, you're probably in more in the center of this. Well. You missed out on one word, innovation. Mm -hmm. I think if you take for granted that you have sort of reached the final the stage, yeah, yeah. Yeah, or you have the toolkit in place, yes. you miss out because there are so many smart people out there. There are so many smart right. solutions. And I was thinking about it. We work a lot in South Sudan. If we were to build what is the ordinary infrastructure, the way of thinking, to provide education and uh, health to the population of South Sudan. Well, then it would not happen in my lifetime, yes. not in any yes. of our lifetimes. If we think distant learning, if we think linking up between institutions, if we think new partnerships, well, right. actually access yeah. to education might be a viable option right. for so many more people. Yeah. The same with health. We see medical doctors who are doing these magic things online, guiding maybe not so experienced doctors yes. elsewhere. We need to think yeah. new ways of delivering services. Can I? Yeah, please jump in. Yeah, yeah and anybody you know, else? Yeah. yeah, on the on those two sides of the uh, mitigation, you know, let's let's leave the energy infrastructure right. for now and let's just look at forests. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have a lot of carbon that is emitted, you were talking about your experience mm. in Indonesia and all of, mm. all, all, of, all of those. Now the question really is, if you take the Congo Basin for example in Africa, the second largest in the world, but they have more positive carbon sinks, they, they, they take all the carbon out. In fact, it's, it's a net carbon sink actually for the world. Mm -hmm. But who actually compensates them for that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I keep the forest cover there, I yes. sequester carbon, but there's no money for me. Right, yes. So what is the incentive to yes. actually do right. that? And that's why for me, I really think it's time for us to have like an African a permanent carbon sink that actually supports mm -hmm. countries that are doing all these positive externalities for the environment. That's one thing that I think it's very, very important for very us to do. Very good point, yeah. Then the second one, of course, with uh, the issue of uh, mitigation is the issue of energy transition. I think you were mm -hmm. beginning to, to, to say a bit about that. Now, you know, I, if you like, I, I, I like taking vacations and I like cruise ships, okay? Mm -hmm. So you go on a cruise ship. So you leave your cabin, you go around to another place, you, what's that stuff everybody throws in? Um, bowling. Uh? bowling or? Bowling, yeah. yeah. So, so you like bowling <laughs> and you go and bowl and all of those things, you play some golf and all yeah. those things and stuff like that. Nice. That, is, that, is, that is transition for wealthy countries. Yes. You transition from your room to very comfortable places right. and there's nothing stopping you because right. you have 100% energy already. Mm -hmm. They are just trying to change your energy mixes. Mm -hmm. Now, take poor developing countries or low income developing countries. For them, it's almost like a, like a kennel, a small kennel. You mm -hmm. have paddle here and paddle here. Yes. So if you flip from this side to this side, you're going to tumble. Mm -hmm. right? That is the difference. So I think that as we talk about mitigation, we need to realize that countries are at different stages of development. Mm -hmm. Access to technology is very, very different. Resources are very, very different. And therefore, we've got to be more practical. Because mm -hmm. when people say just energy transition, right. I think we have to also start talking about just energy systems that provide you with access to electricity, that provides you with affordability of electricity, that provides you with uh, electricity uh, stability and security. So you, in the, in the, sorry, sorry, go ahead. No, no, do you see in, uh, in Africa this evolution that I'm talking about that I'm picking up in the Middle East of leaders now realizing they have to build their legitimacy through resilience, by generating resilience, not resistance? Yeah. You know, for example, you know, I was on a panel at Davos uh, with one uh, 
of the African heads of state, and I remember mentioning oh. that. If you're going to be in power, right. give power, which means give, right. give electricity. Yes, interesting. Right? Mm. Yeah. I like that. So, I like that. So, <laughs> I'm going to steal that. That's yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. You know, and then, and, you know, but, but, but that's very, very important in terms of being accountable for people. For me, I just think there are a lot of things that we see. You were talking about the issue of cooking, uh, uh, cooking, clean cooking. Uh, yeah. clean cooking. Uh, you know, it doesn't make sense that 300,000 women will die mm. just from trying to cook a right. decent meal. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And that 300,000 in Africa, yeah. kids will die because they carry it on the back because of secondary smoke. Right, it right, doesn't yeah. make any sense. Yeah. So we have to have accountability. Right to people for right. developmental right. results, yes. right? I think that is very, yeah. very important. That's your legitimacy yeah. as a government or as any mm. institution is for those ones that you are actually serving. Now, what you were saying about the issue of resilient uh, leaders, one thing I just wanted to, uh, when you're talking, well, let me, let me, let me come back first mm. on the issue of the um, uh, mitigation yes. and adaptation. For adaptation in Africa, I think quite honestly, Tom, Africa is struggling to breathe right now. Right, mm. interesting. What do you mean by that? Okay, so three things. We got three crises at the same time. We got a climate crisis in which Africa contributes no more than 3% to glo uh, global greenhouse right. gas emissions. Yeah. But it suffers disproportionately from the negative consequences mm. of it. Mm. You go to Mozambique, for example. The hurricanes were there. 1,000 people died. Okay, through $2 billion of infrastructure, mm. which is very expensive to build actually were lost as a result well, of, uh, of that. Mm -hmm. And you look, for example, in East Africa, we have all this mm -hmm. crisis that's actually going right. on because of, uh, uh, of climate change. So we do need to actually adapt. Yes. Because it's like a deluge. Right. Exactly. Yeah. right. So you have climate crisis, you have a debt situation that's a problem, right. and then you have the COVID-19 situation. Mm -hmm. So it's like when it, it doesn't rain, it pours. Yeah. Right. And so it's just too much the fiscal space isn't there to be yeah. able to, uh, to, to deal with that. That's why we absolutely must have financing to do climate adaptation. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. but, the, but, but the losses for Africa are immense mm -hmm. now. Yes. We yeah. lose $7 billion to $15 billion a year right now wow. because of climate yeah. change. Mm -hmm. If that doesn't change in terms mm -hmm. of having adaptation, that's going to grow to roughly yes. $50 billion yeah. by yeah. 2040. Yeah. And that's why we decided at the African Development Bank to do something about that. We, you know, we, 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 we announced that we've doubled our climate finance to $25 billion by 2025. Mm. In addition to that, we're focusing a lot of our financing on adaptation, right? The, the UN Secretary General has thought, well, we ought to devote 50% to adaptation and 50% to mitigation. Well, we passed that mm. priority in 2018. Interesting. Today, we have 63% of That's our right. financing yeah. going to Adapt adaptation. Interesting. And we just launched something called the African Adaptation Acceleration Program. Mm. Uh, myself and uh, former UN mm. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, mm. with Center Global, uh, Global Center for Adaptation, Interesting. to mobilize an additional $25 billion Perfect. to go into adaptation. Yeah, so that it. is, I just want to say that, you know, it is very important. And the last thing I'll say, you know, because we're both economists on this, and I and I want to raise this issue. I think the way we measure wealth of nations mm -hmm. is wrong. Because when you, when you measure wealth of nations by gross domestic product, mm -hmm. it's just the value of goods and services right. that you're producing. It doesn't tell you anything about the technologies that, produce, mm -hmm. that produces it, the negative externalities that yes. it, it does. Now, so your wealth actually is causing my poverty. Yeah. <laughs> and so we've got to be able to then re-index yes, right. yeah. the wealth of nations by what they are contributing or not contributing. So you take Gabon. I was giving the example of Gabon. If Gabon has that amount of positive and, uh, thing for the, for the environment, if I were to weight its, its, its GDP, right, possibly for that, its debt to GDP ratio will go down. Mm -hmm. It will have a greater room to be able to actually borrow more money that it can use for climate resilient infrastructure and all of that. And the wealthy countries who think they are wealthy right now at the expense of the rest yes. of us yeah. will not look as, as, uh, as wealthy. So if you're trying to actually change things systemically yes. globally, yeah. we have to make sure we are not rewarding yes, right. growth processes yes. that generates consequences for us that we have to be us running around yeah. looking for how to fix. So what you measure, yeah. And how you measure it, yes. for me, is fundamental to this particular issue. Terrific. 
Julia and Mary, do you want to jump in on any of this? Um, yeah. we're, yes, I do. Please, but please uh, go uh, ahead. No, 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 we'll go uh, to the floor. Uh, please. Yeah. Very quickly. I mean, I just think um, uh, this is. Uh, too uh, complex a world for an either or mm -hmm. uh, narrative right. or strategy. And um, I mean, we, we're obviously living through a huge global shock with the uh, pandemic, and no one was there saying either or then when the world was trying to That's deal right. with the virus. It was like, right. what can we do to get a vaccine? What can we do to get to therapeutics? What can we do to improve treatment protocols for people who are uh, you know, in intensive care, is lying on their front better or lying on their back better? That's right. uh, what can we do in terms of public health? What it's can we analogy. do with masks? Yeah. What can we do with shutting down offices? You know, we threw everything plus the kitchen sink yeah. at it. And, and the more know, we did here, the more it made easier the adaptation later. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, Very good point. And one of the things I think our world did is it steadied, not everywhere, but it steadied generally behind the science. So we've got to remember we came into this pandemic in an age where climate science was being questioned, where people were tossing their heads in major public mm -hmm. policy debates saying, oh, experts, what do they know anyway? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then all of us spent months and months and months watching the chief medical officer <laughs> or the chief scientist yeah. all knowledgeably talking to each other about our rates, yeah. um, you know, and science has found a way uh, to help us deal Absolutely. with this pandemic. So I think, you know, in the analogy with climate, we've got a steady again behind the science and recognise that we've got to do the vast sweep of things because we've got to make a difference in as many ways as possible given the size of the problem. Great. Mari. Again, agree. It's not either or adaptation, yeah. resilience or mitigation. Uh, it's, it's all and they're related. Uh, that's the first point. The second point is that, as you were saying, different countries will have different issues, whether it's more adaptation or resilience or mitigation. And in the small, vulnerable countries uh, that you, and the poorest countries, it's more about adaptation and resilience. And that's why our lending to uh, the poorest, uh, the, the low income countries, which is the IDA program, we have a huge uh, component, which is on disaster risk management and uh, building up uh, resilience. Whereas in the middle income countries, it's more about mitigation. But you know, they are, you cannot separate them actually. And then within mitigation, which systems should you prioritize in that country? Uh, so it, it, it is about getting, for us, getting the investments uh, right and in the effective places and, and having the, the impact, right? Uh, and uh, we have also ramped up our uh, climate finance uh, to 35% of our finance and 50% of that goes to adaptation because of the recognition sure. that, you know, it has been actually less recognized compared to mitigation, but yet it's so important. And then you mentioned the Wealth of Nations, so can I advertise a little bit? <laughs> we are going to launch our Wealth of Nations, uh, I think it's the second or third report, tomorrow. And it definitely talks about the importance of natural capital, human capital, and uh, physical capital as to how you measure uh, well, uh, beyond GDP. And that is hopefully going to also be able to uh, let us understand you know, what, wh how much we are destroying natural capital mm -hmm. with this climate change and therefore what is the actions that we, we need to do. Uh, actually, it is showing uh, de uh, you know, a decline in natural capital, mm -hmm. uh, which is going to affect our wealth right? and, and, and our That's development. Uh, I'm going to open the floor. Um, uh, please raise your hand. And well, this our, we got roving mics. Uh, you lady over there, and right there. Yeah, and tell us who you are. And, uh. My name is Alice Hill. I'm with the Council on Foreign Relations, and thank you for the excellent panel. Thank you for your terrific work in trying to get at this issue of infrastructure. We are seeing now the collision of the adaptation efforts with the mitigation efforts when they meet infrastructure. Our infrastructure is not up to the impacts we're already seeing. Energy grids failing, flood barriers are failing, but we don't really have plans, and that's what I want to ask you. What are your strategies to build climate resilient infrastructure? We don't have resilient building codes really anywhere in the world. So when you're asking, let's have that bridge last for the next 50, 100 years, is it in the right location? 
and is it high enough? What are the strategies you're using to make sure that every dollar you're spending today mm -hmm. is resilient in the future? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, what are your strategies for that collision of adaptation and mitigation, which is malmitigation, which could be what happened in Australia or California. What would that we mean? have what would, solar what, what, power. What's mal malmitigation? Malmitigation would be making mitigation choices without considering adaptation. Mm -hmm. So solar panels. You have put up a slew of solar panels, as we have in Australia and in the Western United States and in the Middle East. Uh, wildfires occur or cloud cover occurs. Mm, wildfires, the smoke falls yeah. on the solar panels. Huh. You can't produce enough energy. You turn to generators. You turn to coal power plants to uh, take care of it. So, or maladaptation, which would be, for example, uh, a desalination plant. It takes a huge amount of energy. If you're not thinking about, okay, what is the source of energy for that desalination plant that will get me fresh water? you're going to have caused more trouble. Mm. This is, a, in my work, seems to be an understudied, under-considered challenge, but we are at great risk of spending a lot of money now for things that won't last or that can hurt us on one side or the other of this equation. And my question is, what are the strategies to address that to make sure that we're made, spending our dollars wisely, limited number that we have, huge demand for them, mm -hmm. we can't afford to make a lot of mistakes. Great. So, so thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, would you, you start off on that, Greta, if you would, because that's right in your... Exactly, and thank you so much for the question. And when I said we are advocating radical changes in uh, how we do infrastructure from the start till the end, what we have been doing is working with a number of governments in actually thinking through, assessing where are we today, what are the important things for us to achieve, and therefore how do we get there. So having identified what do we need, and since we need multiple things and we cannot do them at the same time, how do we think prioritization so when we come to item number 10, it fits in to the other nine that have already been implemented. So this kind of sort of integrated approach we have now applied in a number of countries. I can mention Ghana because we have been doing this also with a center, a global center of adaptation. So understanding the needs to ensure we also see how they can be met. So when it is energy, what kind of sources are available, renewable sources, and who do we invite in to ensure this can be implemented? We need to touch the big money. So for UN organization like UNOPS, this goes far beyond the official development aid so we work with the governments, help them prioritize national resources. We also work with the private sector because there is, I mean, investable projects in so many of these things. So actually to attract private investors to the table, I would almost say from the start, so you can have this political decision making also in how you want to engage the private sector up front has been important. Mm -hmm. So you understand, I'm not giving you a yes or no answer, it's complicated, but it's starting to work. Also seeing how small island states actually benefit from this is really I would say awarding for an organization like ours. We know that these small Island states are maybe facing the climate challenges first and really hard. And also working in so many countries that have actually experienced from earthquake, floods or whatever, how a crisis is really destroying uh, the infrastructure and also causing lives 
to ensure that we build back better, that we have access to the technology at affordable prices, make us really eager to understand what is it out there that we can apply. So when we build affordable homes in, again, I go back to uh, Ghana, Kenya, Pakistan, we build it with sort of world-class technology that we know have been certified to live through earthquakes. Mm. So again, how we build these partnerships that really matter to uh, mm. infrastructure. And I can't, I can't forget you say this is boring. Tom. <laughs> <laughs> it's so I important. I like it. Floats my boat. I mean, I really. And <laughs> also look at the panel. We are now three women here. <laughs> infrastructure there is would have been too, a fourth too. <laughs> too important to be left to the men. Yeah. <laughs> I just said that. Yes. And I'm think that. about yeah. it. I'm think gonna let you pick up on that. <laughs> think about it. GDP. That was to calculate the value of warfare. Interesting. And women's work was not even <laughs> evaluated to be put into it. So yeah. we need to rethink value mm -hmm. and what incentives are there to invest in doing the right things first. Thank you. Can I, can I answer? Can I Thank answer you all for her question? Out of <laughs> can I just quickly yeah, yeah. answer her question? Yeah, please, because she asked, what, what, what are we you. doing? Yeah. Uh, I think we, we, together with partners like UN Ops. We are trying to measure the uh, resilience. We have resilience indicators and assessments of countries. So that's at the country level. Uh, and that hopefully will help to assess whether you, know, you, you are building the infrastructure in the right place, et cetera, et cetera. So all we are working, I think, already in 30 countries, but we hope to do more. And as part of the uh, UNFCCC, the, besides NDCs, countries are also supposed to come up with their national resilience plans. So this is, I think, uh, something important for all of us in terms of the science, of, in terms of the knowledge to work on. On the private sector, because you mentioned specific projects, there is a UN initiative uh, on climate resilient investments. Uh, and they are trying, this. the insurance industries, it's the uh, banks and it's the private sector. They want to also come up with, uh, you know, how do you actually measure uh, in, whether investment is climate resilient or not. And hopefully they will come up with measurements and indicators that will assess this because I think climate risk uh, has become now, uh, you know, this is probably one of the most exciting COPs I have been to, just yeah, the amount of exactly. financial sector yeah. people here, uh, that it, climate uh, risk is a risk that they have to be able to, to uh, calculate. Cool. Yeah, since I'm the... Well, the other, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so some guy talk. Yeah, <laughs> guy, so have some guy talk. <laughs> now, I, I think that uh, the, that's an excellent question, and I think the starting point for me is not that we start building climate resilient infrastructure today as we should, but recognize that we already have legacy infrastructure, that we have to climate proof, right? So I think that's a very, very important thing, and I agree mm -hmm. with the point in terms of assessing the stress levels, assessing the risks, and also looking into what that means for the pricing of the risk for those infrastructure, mm -hmm. because that's a very yeah. important mm -hmm. uh, issue. Uh, the other one is, you know, even how we do international procurement on infrastructure, right? So we say the, for the lowest cost bidder. Well, I went to um, a meeting in France once, and um, as soon as I came off the stage, these guys came up to me and said, well, you know, um, we are a, a, a constructing firm, so a particular country, which I will not name, um, but that we actually don't get contracts from your, from your bank. And I said, well, the president of the bank doesn't give any contracts. What is the, what the issue? He said, no, because what I mean is that when you actually are called for all these bids and some countries come to our bidders and we can never compete and we think we are better than them. The point I want to make is this. Infrastructure are long-term investments. They are very, very expensive investments. They are better done right the first time, mm. right? Yeah. And so we have to look at not just the cost of the infrastructure, the life cycle maintenance cost mm -hmm. yeah. of those infrastructures. So you're getting quality infrastructure. The, the least expensive, maybe the worst infrastructure, you're gonna spend a lot more money trying to fix it. 
The other one is just to follow up on your point on the, on the countries. Because at the end of the day, 68% of all the infrastructure we're talking about is actually financed by countries. Well, we are told we are bank on ourselves and everybody mm -hmm. to align ourselves to, uh, to, 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 to Paris, okay? So we are aligning to Paris Agreement because, yes, we will. However, of what use is that if we align and the countries don't have the resources to develop mm -hmm. the bankable projects to do climate resilient infrastructure, mm -hmm. green infrastructure, it's, it's, we can't lend to ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. So we do need to have facilities that allow the countries to develop bankable projects mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that actually are green infrastructure projects and also their long-term strategies mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. as you said, yeah. but also their nationally determined uh, uh, contributions. Now, the thing that infrastructure for Africa, for example, um, you know, we're working right now to try and launch something called an alliance uh, for green infrastructure. Because I like the point that you were making about the institutional investors. Mm -hmm. You've got green bonds, you've got all these green investments that are out there that can go into that. But you've got to structure the infrastructure. Yeah. There has to be a way you can rate it, you can label it. This is green, this is not green. It's mm -hmm. a quality and so on and so forth. So these are the things that I feel that uh, we need to, to, to do. And just to, just to finish on the issue of risk, the risk term is going to yeah. be much higher. Yes, yeah, for everything. For yes. everything, yeah. But then the issue is um, we need to develop and deploy a lot better uh, risk mitigating strategies uh, risk sharing facility for private sector. I agree with yes. your private sector. Mm -hmm. So whether it's a partial credit guarantees that you do or a partial risk guarantees that you do to, 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 to crowd in the mm -hmm. private uh, uh, sector. When we had to do the, the, the um, Lake Tokana mm -hmm. um, uh, wind in, in, uh, in uh, Kenya, mm -hmm. uh, which is the largest um, uh, wind uh, power plant in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, the question really was the private sector was investing in it but there are counterparty risks in terms of what if the government does not meet its commitment to lay the transmission lines mm -hmm. uh, in time. So we had to provide 20 million euros to, okay, if that doesn't happen, then we will actually do a partial risk guarantee to, to support that. We need more of those things to be But that's why right. if you're not mitigating, then the risk element for adapting it's goes, up. Yeah. It's Where it's go, it's go, yeah. it goes way up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But one last thing I should just say on the, on the project preparation side, we're quite excited about, and people don't actually realize how much, um, how profitable it is to actually invest in project preparation. Mm -hmm. yeah. So for example, at the bank, the African Development Bank, we have a facility that's called the NEPAD uh, uh, Infrastructure Preparation Facility. Mm -hmm. uh, we put in $68 million into it. And it, we've used it to develop and close uh, uh, financing for infrastructure award $23 billion from 60 something million dollars. So we also helped to establish something called the Africa 50, which is a private equity fund actually chair their, their, their board. And it's raised $850 million. It has a company that actually does nothing but just infrastructure mm -hmm. project preparation. So I think I agree with technology. I also think that we need to have the vehicles that will develop the right infrastructure but also the financing structure mm -hmm. that would support Standard. the private sector to invest a lot more okay. in those infrastructure. Yeah. Um, who else? All, all the way in the back there, yeah. Hi there, I'm Harry Beamish. I work for uh, the Missions Capture Company. Um, I spent my whole career in sustainable infrastructure, um, pre predominantly emerging markets, and I'm most recently now in Africa. Um, I wanted to ask the, the panel about their, I suppose, their view on what, how they see energy transition, because energy transition by nature requires a transition. But what I see right now is countries such as South Africa, heavily dependent on coal. That coal dependency is not going anywhere. It's for the next 20, 30 years. I mean, whatever anyone says. It may reduce the dependency, but it's not going anywhere. Now, the issue is there's no financing available, as far as I can see, to help that transition. How do that, how does those coal plants become more efficient, emit less, um, emit less sulfur in the short term? In that 20 year period, how, how do we, are there any financing mechanisms to help that transition? Because everyone will finance a wind farm. Everyone will finance a solar farm. Because it's nice, it's easy, it's clean, it's obvious, no? The issue is the transition. How do, do are there actually mechanisms allowing that transition to be less carbon intensive? 
Yeah, please, Brian, I, go ahead. I, yeah. can, and, yeah. I can have a go with that. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of discussion right now, as you know, going on about uh, coal transition. I'll give you a, a, a nice statistics. I think it's like 2,153 gigawatts that have to be retired by 2040 if we're going to get rid of all the, yeah. the coal-fired power plants. And that's 100 gigawatt a day, 100 gigawatt a year, which is retiring one coal plant a day. And the cost is about uh, $1 trillion uh, a, a year, right? So it's a huge cost. So you, your question is very well asked, put it that way. Uh, and how do we, uh, there's been, I've been like in many, many discussions on this, and, and I think that the conclusion is that, yes, there needs a lot, there, we need a lot of funding for this, and it, it, it private sector is not going to come in and decommission a, a coal-fired power plant. So what is emerging is that you need to, to package it as a, as a platform, as a structure, where you have the decommissioning of the coal plant which is probably going to have to come from either public funding or donor funding or grant funding. And then you have a second component, which is what do you do with the stranded asset, you know, whether it's the coal mine or the actual uh, retired coal power plant. Repurposing the asset and the land that's there, that can be partly uh, taken by the private sector. Then there's a third component, which is the just transition component. Who is going to compensate the coal miners and all the uh, economy and the community. You don't want you don't want stranded assets, but you don't want stranded communities or stranded workers. How do you deal with that? That that's more like government yeah. or public funding. Exactly. Then you have the last component, which is renewable energy. Mm -hmm. What do you replace the coal-fired power plant with? You have the renewable energy, and that's where private sector can come in. But you need to structure that as one, and then you need the government to have the the policies and the reforms. Uh, over a long term, you know, it's a long term investment. So the governments have to be committed to the reform. And normally it also includes a public utility in the middle of that. <laughs> and then you have to reform the public utility. So the government has to have that political commitment. Yeah. What were you saying just then? Power is. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to go stay in power, yeah, you have yes, to be power. Yes, yeah. that's right. So that that's key for that package to work. But then who does what in that funding as well as bringing technology, bringing uh, all kinds of uh, uh, incentives into that package, including the project preparation. There are all kinds of funding also, including philanthropy, Rockefeller, uh, Bloomberg, uh, they have come up with a fund uh, that could potentially provide grant funding as well as uh, project preparation funding. And then you can have de-risking mm -hmm. instruments like yeah. you mentioned, you know, all kinds of financial structures that can come up. But they all have to come together. It can't just be standalone. So I'm just trying to describe to you what, what is trying to happen. Uh, I hope that it can start happening. And the, there are a few pilot projects out there, South Africa uh, being one of them, because the World Bank uh, is involved in the one in South Africa. And there was an announcement uh, also in this COP uh, with uh, four donor countries also coming in. Uh, to help uh, and and also private sector uh, our private sector arm IFC is also coming in so I, I think that's the way forward but uh, uh, we need many many more uh, not just pilot projects so the, the issue is how do you scale it up I want to give everyone just sort of a last word um, uh, great one start with you and, and um, Mar, we're going to take that as your last word because yes, we're late okay. and then we'll sorry Julia, <laughs> uh, uh, okay. okay thank you so much Tom yeah. and it's really a bad timed uh, question uh, because UNOPS is an implementing agency so I should stay out of responding to that question mm -hmm. because it's highly political mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's highly political yeah. and uh, I think I would start with a quote from my husband he's an actor mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> to make a good play you really need to start to kill your darlings mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but at oh. what point do you start killing them huh. It's when you see the risk of keeping them is getting too high. Mm. So how do you actually cost that risk? It's very much decided by the politicians. Mm. So what kind of taxation do you apply? What do you value? So what value do you actually put to the risk of uh, continuing pollution? And we are starting to see, I think, a very interesting movement in the finance sector. So looking 30 years back, all the money that was invested in brown energy, 
there will be lots of good business cases in uh, investing in green energy going forward. And for many of the brown companies, I guess it's very much about when do you kill your darlings <laughs> and working with governments to ensure the social compact is in place because this is where the transition is really hard. It will cause loss of jobs, loss of opportunities, loss to so many people's hopes if we don't do this well together. So that is my call for this event that let's continue to partner, to find these good solutions. UN, I'm sure the World Bank, and I'm really uh, sort of honored of being part of this panel. We are ready to do our part, but we have only chance if we do this together. Mm -hmm. So back yeah. to you, Tom. Yeah. I don't think, Tom, anybody could say that a panel that ends with killing your darlings is a boring panel or a boring topic, so I think we push back on the staff. Um, I'd, I'd like to just uh, move it a little bit to say uh, beyond that, uh, what we're trying to do is have people uh, uh, live and thrive, and that does mean that uh, health and health considerations have to be uh, very much front and centre as we're tackling this challenge. Super. Can you close That's it up it. for us? Yeah, you know, they, every person that walks, right, is take a walk. The reason we walk is because we've got a column of achievement rate that allows us to do that. That's what infrastructure is. Hmm. If you have good infrastructure, your economy works. If you have better infrastructure that is green, it's even much better. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to continue to invest a lot more in infrastructure, that column vertebrae of economists, mm -hmm. that will make sure the economies can grow, people can create jobs, and all of that. But we must also make sure that, even as the point on the energy transition that he was saying, it's a great question. Exhortation is not a solution. Just simply telling me I'm doing the wrong thing, it's not a solution. The world must put resources that have agreed fully with you that grant money, concession of financing, political will to actually do that energy transition. But that energy transition also requires that you have just energy financing. You can't just have just yeah. energy transition without having the financing. So I think that's fundamental to uh, being able to, uh, to provide. And the last thing I just want to say is that I feel that um, when we talk throughout this COP, this is the COP and the other uh, uh, COP that we're coming from. Uh, there's this talk of these $100 billion that uh, we have to meet. Yes, absolutely, that's fundamental so that we don't break the international trust for developing countries on that. But we must go beyond that. You know, we have to realize it's gonna take trillions of dollars, at least one to two trillion dollars a year, but right, for 30 years to really dig us about the whole of what we have. And so we must get the private sector yeah. in as a critical part or building back better, or building back smarter with greater resources that's actually sitting there. Trillions of dollars is what we need, not billions of dollars. Yeah, there's only one thing as powerful as Mother Nature, and that's Father Greed, the marketplace. <laughs> and um, yeah. uh, you need to leverage both of them. Tell me this wasn't the sexiest panel on infrastructure <laughs> you have ever been to. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> this was great, you guys. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you.